Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, enduring our, our chit chat before. I'm Dr. Liz Watts Malujos. I'm a research archaeologist at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. I'll be the moderator for today's lecture. On behalf of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey and my co organizer, Dr. Aaron Benson, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are so excited for our last event in the speaker series, the, in, the Intersections of Indigenous Knowledge and Archaeology, with a lecture today by Dr. Jane Mount Pleasant. This series is being supported by funds from the Office of the State Archaeologist and the Student Cultural Programming Fee. Uh, before we get started, we'll take care of a little business. Uh, as you know, because you have no option to change this, you guys, our participants will remain muted with the video turned off for the duration of the lecture, but you can submit questions to me directly at any time using the Zoom chat function and a question and answer discussion will follow the lecture as time allows. As I said before, my name is Liz and I work out of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey's American Bottom Field Station in Collinsville, Illinois. The survey, also referred to as ISAS, is a division of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. With about 70 full-time archeologists and support staff working throughout the state, ISAS is one of the largest archeological research institutions in the US. ISAS is dedicated to the preservation and interpretation of the archeological and architectural remains in what is now the state of Illinois. On behalf of the state archaeologist and the director of ISAS, Dr. Timothy Pakatat, today we are honored to host Dr. Mount Pleasant. Before I continue, oops. Before I continue, we would like to recognize that the university and ISAS are located on the ancestral homelands of several tribes. We recognize and acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankisha, Wea, Miamia. Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Chickasaw, and other nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations. This acknowledgement and the centering of native peoples is just a start as we move forward. Now I would like to introduce UIUC's Dean of the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Kimberly Kidwell. Thank you so much, Liz, and thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to be, today, be here today and uh, introduce Dr. Mount Pleasant. You know, I, on behalf of University of Illinois, I welcome you all into the space. And um, you know, what I love so much about this university is how we actually live into interdisciplinarity in a really special way. You know, a lot of people in my college in natural resources and environmental sciences and crop sciences work with people in the institutes. And we all try to do good things to help, help people live better lives. And there's a big history to that too. And I think today I'm excited for one thing, Dr. Mount Pleasant is an agronomist by, by training. So ag is in my blood. So it's, it's fun to see these worlds merge. But I think anytime we can gather and look at things from different perspectives, it's a huge advantage. I think that's the way University of Illinois likes to solve problems. And we have the opportunity to look at things from multiple views, good things happen. So thanks for joining us today. And I hope the lecture is as exciting as I'm anticipating it will be. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Dr. Jane Mount Pleasant is a professor emeritus in the horticulture section of the School of Integrative Plant Sciences at Cornell University. She studies indigenous cropping systems and their productivity. Using her expertise in agricultural science, she examines agriculture from a multidisciplinary perspective that includes history, archeology, span paleobotany, and cultural social anthropology. Although much of her work is focused on uh, Huda, Haudenosaunee agriculture in the 16th through 18th century, more recently, she has expanded her research to include pre-Columbian agriculture in Eastern and Central North America, challenging archeological assumptions about past agricultural practices. Dr. Mount Pleasant received her BS and MS degrees in agronomy from Cornell and her PhD in soil sciences from North Carolina State University. She is of Tuscarora ancestry. Dr. Mount Pleasant, it is my pleasure to hand this over to you. Yes, and I am delighted um, to be here this afternoon. And I think that the organizers, uh, Liz Watts, um, Dean Kidwell, and Director um, 
Paukatet uh, for inviting me. And I'm really pleased to be able to, uh, to share some of my ideas on what pre-Columbian agriculture looked like. Um, I'm going to be emphasizing two things in this talk. First, that mine is an indigenous perspective. My father was Tuscarora, which is one of the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee, or you know, may know them as the Iroquois. Um, and I am also an agricultural scientist. And so I bring both of those perspectives um, to my analysis of pre-Columbian agriculture. Um, I started out by looking at and actually reading a lot of what um, social scientists and humanities scholars were saying about native agriculture. And they seem to identify kind of three things that I fundamentally um, disagree with. First, that native farmers in North America were predominantly shifting cultivators, that their maize-based agriculture was marginally productive with low, low yields, and that native farmers actually sowed the seeds of their own destruction through agricultural practices which caused environmental damage. And so I challenge these assumptions on two fronts. First, I claim that they're founded on biases that privilege Western peoples and their technologies while assuming, sorry, um, the inferiority of indigenous peoples and, and their agriculture. And second, that um, these, these statements, these claims are actually contradicted by agronomic knowledge. So I'll be using those, um, those two kind of um, foci to direct my comments this afternoon. So the claims that I make is that most indigenous agriculture in North America was based on permanent cropping systems, not shifting cultivation, that maize yields range from 30 to 75 bushels per acre, um, which doesn't sound like much compared to contemporary American farmers, but this was uh, much, much higher than European grain yields at the same time. And that finally, that these indigenous cropping systems were largely stable, productive, and ecologically sound. And a lot of this work comes from, the art, from my journal article in Early American Studies from 2015. So one of the first questions is, well, why is the common narrative so wrong? And it's hard to blame one scholar, but um, I'll take a shot at Esther Bozerup this afternoon. Um, Esther Bozerup, you may know as an ag economist um, who wrote her, I think, most famous um, book, Conditions of Agricultural Growth in 1965. And she claimed that, um, that agriculture developed progressively. Um, and it began with, with farmers who were using a, for, a forest fallow that led to a bush fallow, and then to a short fallow, to, um, and then progressed to annual cropping and then multi-cropping systems. And that um, plows are always associated with more advanced agriculture, according to Bozrow. And most important, she said, that shifting cultivation is a developmental stage through which all farmers pass. Well, I claim that Bozrup's paradigm on agricultural development is based on a bias that is often invisible to most Western um, academics. And I take this one quote from her book, which um, is just kind of um, has, had me fuming when I first read it. She says, Quote, the digging stick is the most primitive of the main agricultural tools and the people who use digging sticks are the most primitive among the primitive agricultural tribes living today. By contrast, the highest levels of pre-industrial civilization today have usually been reached by peoples with plow cultivation. Um, only farmers with plows have advanced agriculture and they just happen to be Europeans. Um, and this just makes my blood boil, right? So let's start 
dismantling this or de deconstructing some of these um, claims. First, we need to understand what shifting cultivation is. I actually did my PhD program in the Amazon basin um, in Peru um, and worked with, with shifting cultivators and saw shifting cultivation in, um, in force, right? Well, shifting cultivation is found primarily on acid in fertile soils. It's where farmers cut and burn the existing vegetation and then plant crops in, in the ashes. And after two or three um, cropping, cropping cycles, they abandon the plots um, and clear new land and return to the original areas 10, 15, or even as much as 50 years later and repeat the cycle. But the kicker here is that farmers with fertile soils do not use shifting cultivation. So let's look at shifting cultivation again. And I say that there's two views of this. One is as a developmental stage, and this would be Esther Bozrup and, and other, I'm assuming social scientists who, who believe that um, agricultural development is a, a, a kind of linear pro progressive um, process. And that all farmers started shifting cultivators and advanced to more complex and sophisticated forms of agriculture as they develop. And that pre-Columbian farmers, any place in the Western Hemisphere were engaged in shifting cultivation because they were at the er early stages of agricultural development. Um, agronomists like myself view shifting cultivation as a management um, strategy by farmers. Shifting cultivators farm on nutrient deficient soils. We can predict that shifting cultivators will be found in areas that have acid for infertile soils and that pre-Columbian farmers on fertile soils would not be shifting cultivators. So then the question is, did indigenous farmers in North America have access to fertile soils? And they did. This is a map from USDA. Um, each one of these tiny little green dots represents 25,000 acres of prime farmland. And you can see um, that a good portion of the US um, continent is covered by these, um, these green dots. So there's no question that there was plenty of fertile soil. Um, I'm not the only one that, that claims that um, farmers in North America were not shifting cultivators. Uh, William Doolittle and his cultivated landscapes of native North America I became a real fan of Mr. Doolittle, sorry, um, when I read his, his book, um, Cultivated Landscapes, and the entire chapter on shifting cultivation. And he has done an enormous amount of very, very careful um, scholarship looking at the, the records, um, historical, ethnographic, um, and this is his quote. The overwhelming corpus of evidence indicates clearly and convincingly that although Native North Americans cleared the forest by slashing and burning, they did so for permanent clearance. All right, so maybe we've taken care of shifting cultivation, um, but there is another problem that comes up immediately when we start talking about um, pre-Columbian agriculture in in North America. And that is what I call the plow problem. Um, this is a quote by R. David Hurt um, from his book, American Farm Tools, I think written in 1982. Um, Hurt has also written extensively another book on American Indian agriculture, which is why I absolutely cannot get my arms around, my head around this quote. He says, through the ages, the plow has been the most important agricultural tool. Indeed, without it, farmers could not till the soil and prepare their fields for extensive agriculture. And one wants to say, oh no, how did you get to that? Because here in his own book, he has this picture of um, indigenous farmers down in Central America. Mine and Aztec um, folks were supporting very large populations, 15 to 20 million people. 
They had complex social, political, and economic institutions, and they had an agricultural system that was based on corn without a single plow. But as I note here, plenty of Western bias. Um, there were no plows here, but there was a very productive, intensive, and extensive agriculture that supported large populations of people. So no, plows are not essential for, for agriculture. But it's important to think about why farmers do plow. Um, and this is an agronomist perspective. Um, plowing provides a seedbed that facilitates germination, particularly for small seeded crops like wheat, oats, rye. It's also a wonderful way, effective way to remove existing weeds. It improves soil fertility, and I'm going to talk about this um, in, in more depth. And it's also a way of incorporating soil amendments, perhaps like animal waste. But let's look at, first, before we go to the fertility thing, um, I like to point out what I call this paradox of productivity between European wheat farmers and Iroquois or Haudenosaunee maize farmers, kind of between the, the um, 16th and 18th centuries. And this is grain yields, um, their wheat yields, here from European countries, and you can see they're ranging from barely 10 up to at most a little, perhaps 25 bushels of grain. Um, these two figures over here are based on my own field research over uh, a couple of years in two different sites, which showed that, that um, maize yields in the ranges of certainly 40 to 65 or 70 bushels per acre um, were likely to have been quite common um, in this area. And so the question is, what's going on here? Why were Iroquois or Haudenosaunee farmers able to grow what looks to be three to five times as much grain as their European counterparts? Well, I would say a large portion of this difference, not all of it, has to do with plows. And that's because plowing initially increases soil fertility. And you see this, this farmer with his horses and his, and his plow turning over what looks like a meadow. When you plow, you increase the oxidation of soil organic matter, um, which is critically important um, to grow good crops. Oxidation releases the nitrogen, which is in a form in the soil organic matter that's unavailable to crops, to grain crops like, like wheat or corn or oats. Um, and since nitrogen is usually the most limiting nutrient for cereal grains, when you first plow those fields, you get a flush of nitrogen in a form that the, the wheat crop can use. And so plowing fields that have been fallowed um, and have a significant amount of soil organic um, matter, SOM, releases that nitrogen in forms that the crops can take up. And so they get good yields. The problem is it doesn't work indefinitely. In other words, you see a response, you get good yields in, in your wheat or your oats for several years. But with continuous plowing, the soil, the pool of soil organic matter in the soil decreases every single year. And with it, less nitrogen is released. Um, and as that happens, you continuously um, plow and continuously plant, the grain yields go down, they decline. Soils that are continuously plowed reach a stable level when very little nitrogen is released. And farmers all over the world call these soils worn out. Plowing is the single largest cause of decreased soil organic matter in agricultural fields. So we need to talk a little bit more about this issue of soil organic matter, SOM, tillage, plowing, and soil fertility. Farmers in pre-industrial cropping systems um, have 
only three ways of supplying plant nutrients, and here I'm talking primarily about nitrogen. They can use animal manures, they can use legumes, and here I'm talking about forages um, or green manures like alfalfa or clovers, or they can rely on the soil organic matter that's inherent in the soils. So Native, Ameri Native farmers in the Americas relied exclusively on soil organic matter. They didn't have animal manure because there weren't draft animals and they did not have the legumes of the forages, the alfalfa and the clovers that were used by farmers later in Europe. So they're relying exclusively on soil organic matter. And as I said before, plowing plays a key role in soil organic matter. So this is a, a, a graph from an introductory soils um, textbook that shows what happens when we plow continuously. And the, the um, axis at the bottom here, the horizontal, is the time after start of cultivation or plowing. And it, it jumps by, by 10 years, right? And these areas up here um, indicate the amount of um, first plant residues in the dark green. And then the plant residues decompose and form active organic matter, which then undergoes further transform transformations and becomes slow organic matter. And then there is a further transfer transformation in which that organic matter becomes what we call part of the passive organic matter pool. This passive organic matter pool has almost no effect on soil fertility. Most of the soil fertility is coming from the active organic matter pool, this light green one, and some smaller amounts from this kind of light gray, right? So what we see here is the very sharp decline in those parts of the soil organic matter that could contribute to crop growth through the release of nitrogen. You can stop this process, as it shows here, by putting um, with improved management, like adding animal manure um, or using rotations with clover, and alfalfa, or putting the land back into native vegetation. But the other thing I want to point out here is that this decline occurs without um, any effect, sorry, without any um, input from crop yields. It is simply the plowing that causes this to happen. In other words, it's not crop uptake that's causing the decline in the active organic matter and the available nitrogen. And let me show you this in, a, in another graph. And these are not real numbers. They're simply meant to illustrate the process that's going on. This orange line is soil organic matter. And before the field has been plowed, perhaps it's a, a prairie, a, a, a field that's never seen a plow, we have a high level of soil organic matter. But the available nitrogen in that plowed field is not huge, right? It's, it's, it's modest, but, but not huge. But as soon as you plow, the available N in that, that blue line pops right up, right? The yields in the, in the field are over here. And what we see happening is that with the number of years of cultivation, the soil organic matter goes down. The available N goes down. Um, uh, the available N, sorry, first goes up and then goes down and the yields remain high for quite some time, but are continuously declining. So this is the problem that Europeans faced, European farmers, before they discovered the magic of clover and were able to remediate their worn out soils that they were plowing, right? And this explains a large part of that paradox of productivity. I will mention, it's not completely plowed. They, they were both in, both sets of farmers in, in quite fertile lands. Um, so soils were not playing a part. Um, but the other thing that did 
does play a part is that maize is just a better yielding crop than wheat. So that accounts for some of the difference, but most of it is soil management. And so this again just shows you. Haudenosaunee maize farmers had a tremendous advantage um, over European wheat farmers in the same time periods um, because they had one, a better crop, but two, they were not plowing. Agronomists have known for more than 50 years that plowing de degrades agricultural landscapes. And we have been recommending um, for as long as I've been an agronomist um, that farmers decrease the amount of, of plowing that they do. And this is because plowing destroys soil organic matter and causes soil erosion. Plowing fields continuously without the appropriate amendments results in decreased fertility and lower crop yields. Farmers who plant without plowing have more sustainable and productive soils. We call this conservation tillage. And many, many agronomists and soil scientists will, are sure to tell you that uh, American scientists developed this. But indigenous farmers all over North America have been using conservation tillage for hundreds of years. So if we're going to analyze pre-Columbian indigenous agriculture, I say that we need to start with soils. And in North America, specifically in the areas occupied by pre-Columbian farmers, there are just enormous areas of fertile soils. Mollusols are probably our most productive soils. The areas, this map shows mollusols, the areas that are green indicate that these are humid or these are, these are soils that have adequate moisture for great crop growth, particularly corn, right? When you get farther west, you start to get into more dry areas. These can still be very um, you know, productive soils, better for wheat than corn. And as you go further, they get less and less suitable for agriculture. These are alpha salts. Um, and I particularly love alpha salts because there's a wonderful band that runs across the center of New York State. And this is the area where Haudenosaunee farmers and their settlements were and where they grew their, um, their, good, their good corn. But you can see the entire areas um, in the eastern part of the, the country that have large acreages of, of alpha salts. Again, the, the green indicates good moisture regimes suitable for crop growth. The blue indicates these may be soils that are too wet. And the orange indicates drier soils. And as you get over here, too dry for lots of, of agriculture unless you're, you're going to use irrigation, all right? So indigenous farmers, pre-Columbian farmers in North America had lots of productive soils. If I'm looking at indigenous agriculture here again, the next thing I think of is tillage. How are they actually um, preparing seed beds or planting or, or working these soils? And the, the whole based cropping systems in North America were neither backward or unproductive. In fact, the, the absence of plows here was the foundation of a sustainable and very productive agriculture. It was only when Europe, European settlers came to North America and started with their, their plows and began to um, very systematically dis destroy agricultural landscapes from the eastern um, seaboard all the way west through the Corn Belt, right? Um, uh, it was the plows that were responsible for this degradation. So what I would say is that indigenous farmers were engaged in North America engaged primarily in permanent agricultural systems on highly productive soils. Their use of maize as a stable crop resulted in a very high yielding agricultural system and the absence of plows allowed them to preserve these fertile soils, pre preventing the degradation of soils that occurred under Western plow-based um, agriculture. So just to conclude, much of the academic lit literature on ind indigenous agriculture in North America, I claim is fundamentally flawed. 
the research suffers from a Eurocentric bias that favors Western agricultural systems and finds indigenous agriculture inherently inferior. Researchers also lack fundamental agronomic knowledge that they need to accurately evaluate agricultural systems. As I pointed out before, the stuff about plows and soil fertility um, is in introductory um, soil science textbooks, right? Uh, this is not rocket science, at least not for soil scientists. When we have scholarship that is based on agronomic science and it's combined with an objective worldview that does not automatically privilege European practices, it demonstrates that indigenous farmers in North America were likely among the world's most sustainable and productive farmers. And I think with that, I conclude. And perhaps I should stop sharing. Yes. Okay. So fire away at me. Tell me what I've got wrong. Okay. Uh, we've got several questions rolling in. Um, and I'm going to take one from one of the Indiana colleagues that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think this is in reference to some of your other research that has indicated um, that like a mounding method was used um, in, in planting gardens. Uh, and so he asks, uh, can Dr. Mount Pleasant speak about the fertility or productivity for ridge and furrows uh, method agriculture? Well, I certainly can. And um, I know that my view on mounds is again at, um, in conflict with, with many of the of the archeologists um, and maybe anthropologists that have studied um, ridge and furrow agriculture. Um, there'd been a, a, a belief for a, a long time that it had to do with increasing the number of, of frost-free days. Um, it, I will say that mounds um, do have a, an effect on soil fertility in that they encourage um, that all of the the crop residues and the wheat residues get turned back into that mound. And so as natural decomposition of plant uh, remains occurs, those nutrients decompose right in the area where you're going to have crops growing. And so it does definitely tighten up nu um, nutrient recycling. Um, but the major reason um, for, for growing crops in mounds, um, in, in my mind, and i not, quite so certain that I can speak to um, ridges and furrows as much as I can to, to mounds or, or small hills. But from my mind, um, the major reason is that it's a, a way of controlling plant population and spacing. And the reason that I say this and that I disagree strongly with the idea that this has to do with increasing um, the number of frost-free days that corn grows in. Again, this is from introductory crop science that every um, uh, beginning agronomist learns. In New York State, we plant corn sometime from the middle of May, from early May to the middle of May. We even plant in April, right? Um, and not a single farmer talks about frost-free days. We talk about growing degree days, which has to do with the number of heat units, energy units that a particular area of land receives and the crop is exposed to from the time that the, the crop corn, um, from the time that the soil reaches 50 degrees. So nobody cares anything about frost-free days. You might be wondering, well, why not? Isn't corn sensitive to frost? As I said, we plant corn in New York weeks before the last frost, right? We don't plant beans like soybeans or kidney beans until after the last frost has come. Now, why would that be? It's the agronomy of the plants. When corn comes up, its growing point is still below the soil surface. So if a frost comes, it may affect the first leaves that are coming up, but the growing point of the, of the corn plant is protected because it's underneath 
the soil surface. This is in contrast to a bean plant, which sends up its growing point as soon as the little um, coleoptile emerges from the soil surface, right? So if you plant soybeans in New York State in early May, the possibility of you killing the entire population from a frost is very high, but a corn plant really doesn't care, right? So that's why I knew that frost-free days had nothing to do with why people were doing mounds. They were doing mounds, one, because it, it helps the mounds help the, the soil does warm up faster, no doubt about that, right? It's got increased surface area. It's got better drainage, right? So the soil conditions are better. Um, but the secret to the mounds, I think, is that they are an ingenious way of controlling plant population and spacing, which are both critically important for corn. Wheat, you can broadcast seed. In other words, you can, you can scatter the seed willy-nilly, right? Wherever you want. And the wheat plants have the capacity to send up a tiller in response to open spaces, right? Corn plants can't do that. They can, but only very limited. So of course, wheat farmers in Europe in the 1600s and 1700s were broadcasting their seeds. Corn planters in North America and Central America and South America were carefully planting their crops, their corn in lines, and in regular, um, in regular patterns, because the corn cannot compensate for an empty space. And if you have empty spaces in a cornfield, then you lose yield. So the mounds are just an elegant solution. If you've ever planted sweet corn in your home garden, you get out strings and tape measures, and you very carefully put seeds every six, eight inches, you put three feet between the rows, when you plant grass seed in your front yard, do you do that? No, the grass seed tillers, right? Corn can't tiller, or at least um, not very easily. So that's my line on mounds, right? Excellent, thank you. Oh, I feel like we're all learning so much from you today. I know, <laughs> I know I am, I haven't given much, I've never planted sweet corn myself. So I haven't thought much about the difference in between uh, the way you seed corn and the way you seed uh, grass or wheat or something like that. Well, and I have to say even, you know, today wheat farmers plant wheat with a drill in, in, in careful rows. Um, but that's because we have wheat varieties that can really take advantage of that. And we have machines that, that do it very, very easily. But back in the time before mechanization, uh, wheat farmers use a broadcast method and corn farmers every place in the world very carefully plant their corn in regular patterns, right? So. Thank you. Uh, we've got a, oh, a list. Good. Yes, okay. Or no, did you want to continue? Well, I just wanted to, to say that, um, I mean, maybe it's not obvious, in the, in the mound system, um, if, you, if you usually, what your corn people have done is they might plant four to five corn seeds in that mound, right? Um, when you have high fertility, you want a high population. But if you have low fertility, you want a lower population. So when you have a mound, you have a, a real easy way to change population numbers. You can either increase the number of seeds per mound or decrease it. Also, it's really neat because you don't have to, even children can plant mounds. Whereas if you're not using mounds, you need an experienced um, farmer to make sure you're planting regularly. The only thing that, that has to be remembered in the mound system is did you plant it or not? And oftentimes just throwing a stick or a stone in the mound to indicate it, it's got seed, you don't need to do it, right? And even kids can do it, so. Excellent. Okay, we have uh, another question. Are there alternative ways potentially used by indigenous peoples to increase nitrogen in the soil? 
I mean, the, the, the ways of increasing nitrogen in, in the soil are to take advantage of areas that are floodplains that are getting, you know, sediments deposited, um, you know, periodically, maybe not regularly, but um, you're, you're, you're getting, you know, sediments. Uh, any type of, of plant residue <clears throat> that's added to the, to the soil, uh, but you need large quantities, right? So we're, we're not just talking, you know, a couple bundles of, of, you know, of leaves or something. You need large quantities. Um, the other way of, of adding uh, nitrogen to the soil is, is through other or organic materials like fish. Um, there's a lot of indication in, the, in New England that farmers there on poor soils, these are spodosols, predominantly in much of the area were, were adding fish to their, to their fields. But they were, these were much more what we would call gardens. This was not large scale agriculture the way, um, you know, Haudenosaunee or I'm suspecting Cahokian peoples were likely planting their fields. These were in New England, much, much smaller. And so they would, they would get um, probably um, fish that were coming in, small fish coming in large quantities in the spring and, and dump them on, onto their, their cornfields. Right? Um, animal manure, you just couldn't get it in, in quantities because there, there weren't draft animals, right? So um, bones and, and, and food refuse um, could be thrown onto fields. But again, I mean, in a lot of places, and I can talk more knowledgeably about Haudenosaunee, but we're talking about cornfields. 100, 200 acres in size. I mean, you know, household scraps are, are not going to go very far in, in that kind of system. And so you really need to be relying on the soil organic matter that's already there, farming on soils that are inherently fertile, and then not destroying them by plowing. Thank you. Um, okay, got another great question. Can you talk of the concept of the planting of the three sisters, corns, beans, and squash in combination and whether um, such would gain any other benefits that you did not previously mention from mound use? Yeah, I mean, certainly the corn, beans, and, and squash, um, what we call polycultures are um, typical of, um, of farmers in most parts of the world. Um, farmers that are, are producing for themselves. In other words, not cash crop farmers, but subsistence farmers. And almost every one of these systems will have a grain crop and a legume. And so in this case, the, the corn is the, is the grain and the, the beans are the legume. Um, some of these crop, some of these systems like the Three Sisters also include other crops as well. Perhaps sunflowers, um, it does, um, different types of, of squash, things like that. And so people might ask, well, um, why, why would you add these other crops? And um, there's been an awful lot of research in the last 30 years on polycultures and intercropping. And there's a lot of evidence that indicates that you can get <clears throat> um, yields that are at least equal to what you get in monocultures and sometimes greater. Now, one of the things that I find that people often um, mistake is that they assume because there's beans in the system that the beans are going to add nitrogen. Yes, the beans do add nitrogen, um, but most of the nitrogen in a bean crop, a legume crop like a kidney bean or, or a, a scarlet runner or one that might have been used in the, the three sisters, most of the nitrogen is in the bean and the bean is removed and eaten. So the only nitrogen that's left is what's in the stem and the leaves and the roots. And that is relatively minor. And so claims by, by people that um, by incorporating um, beans into the cropping system, they were adding you know, lots of nitrogen, not true. In fact, you can look at Europe and see um, uh, that when European farmers added dry beans to their rotations with wheat, they saw almost no increase in yields, right? A little bit here and there, um, but, but not much. They were doing turnips and, and dry beans and wheat and trying a few other things like that. 
they did not see a significant um, increase in yields until they added clover, right? Um, and, and clover is a perennial legume as opposed to beans, which are annuals, right? So perennial legumes put down great root systems. They have lots of stems and leaves and their seeds are tiny. You're not growing this legume for the seed. People aren't going to eat it. Rather, you're feeding the tops of the plant to animals, right? Um, but the magic of clover and alfalfa is that even when you cut the top off and you can cut it off three, four, five times a year, it regrows because its root system is intact and it's still out there pumping away, right? Um, and so that was what saved European agriculture based on plows. They learned to incorporate um, clover and alfalfa into their rot rotations and all of a sudden their yields be began to, to go up. So yes, beans were wonderful in the Three Sisters and the corn, beans and squash provided a very balanced diet. The three crops have very different growth habits. The, the beans twine around the, the corn, there are pole beans, so you don't have to use poles. The squash has a very different growth habit. It's aggressive. It covers the, the ground. I always say about if you've ever planted squash or pumpkin in your back garden, you put it in, you turn around, you look behind you and it's following you up to the back porch, right? It'll take over the entire garden, right? Um, well, that's great if you're trying to keep down weeds, right? You have to be careful that the beans and the squash don't take over the corn because the corn is the primary engine of the system and you want to make sure that whatever you do, the beans and the, the squash just complement rather than compete with, right? So, um, yes, the, the whole, that system is an amazing system. It's really, it's complicated and... I've got an article on it, both from nutritional yields, food, food values, and on kind of economic components of it. Okay, we're going to switch gears with a very Cahokia specific question. Right. One of the apparent changes that allowed Cahokia to assume urban proportions seems to have been incorporating upland mollusols. Um, from the Richland complex into their agricultural system, formerly based mostly in floodplain soils. Can you speak to what that might have enabled them to do? Well, I would imagine that the number one, the upland mollusols kind of have wonderful characteristics. As I mentioned before, these are prime agricultural soils and they didn't have the disadvantage of being subject um, to, you know, flooding as the, the flood, floodplain soils did, right? So you've got fertile soils that are in an area um, that's not going to um, have the risk of, of, you know, getting flooded every three years or five years or, or seven years. So that what that means is that you can begin to, um, to count on a particular agricultural yield every year. The other neat thing about corn um, and beans um, is that they will both both store well, and even squash stores well, provided you dry it down, you know, to some you know degree. It's not going to store as long as corn and beans, but it will still store very well. So to me, the the move to upland mollusols um, makes perfect sense for you know people that are looking to expand their their agriculture and to have a predictable and very stable you know food supply. Thank you, sorry, I was taking notes. <laughs> I wasn't quick to the draw. Um, okay, can you speak to the agronomics of some of the other crops native farmers grew like kinopodium, knotweed, and little barley? I'm not the person for this, right? Um, <laughs> certainly Gale Fritz and um, others are much better at this. Um, but the, the nutritional profiles of some of these crops are really impressive. They have high protein contents. Um, they appear to yield quite well. Um, Natalie Muller has, you know, done some great work on this and, and um, you know, certainly shows that they can be comparable with, with maize-based systems. Um, but other than that, 
I can't talk. So you're going to have to ask Natalie or perhaps Gail if she'll come out of retirement and give some some answers to this. But um, no, I'm not the person for this, right? All right, Gail does have a, a recent book out called Feeding Cahokia. Yes, to right. check that out. So it, do a little a plug for book. Gail since I can't. Yes, read the book. It's a terrific book. Okay. Um, okay, I have another sort of Mississippian specific question. Um, what variety of maize was used or considered for your Iroquois productivity studies? How does this compare to productivity of the Flint maize introduced to the eastern uh, eastern woodlands circa 900 AD? Um, we used a, um, a traditional open pollinated um, white flower corn, right? Um, which is still grown by many Iroquois you know, communities. In fact, it's, I think it's grown in every Iroquois community along with many other varieties of, you know, flint and flour and um, sweet corn and popcorn. Um, lots and lots of native peoples are growing um, corn like this. We thought that this corn variety, um, the, the white flower corn, had probably been um, in the in the form that we were seeing for a couple of hundred years. Um, I mean, so we're talking about in the, in the 1990s that this was similar to corn that would have been grown in the 1600s, right? Um, uh, perhaps, you know, certainly some, some changes, uh, but how it compares with, with corn from, from 500 years previous, I can't say. Um, I, sus I suspect that back in 900 or 1,000, the corn would have been much less impressive than, than it was by the 16 and 1700s. In other words, um, smaller cobs, maybe not as robust um, kernels and, and things like, like that. But um, no, I, I can't say that absolutely. Right? But at least back to the 1600s, fairly similar. And I personally, I was wondering if you could speak a little more about um, the uh, revitalization of corn varieties or maize varieties uh, that you worked on. And if you have happened to work with any tribes ancestral to the Midwest on like food sovereignty projects with those corn varieties. Um, no, I haven't. Um, I realized very, very quickly in the, the corn revitalization, we I got started with it back in the, oh, late 1980s, early 1990s, because um, Iroquois people, Haudenosaunee people were coming to Cornell saying, we're in danger of losing. Um, we've already lost many, many um, of our you know, varieties and we wanna make sure that we don't lose them all. And so um, I was active with the American Indian program then. And um, I said, yes, be glad to work on it and worked with the a corn breeder at Cornell, Margaret Smith, who was invaluable in providing advice and help. And she had a graduate student, Frank um, Kutka, um, who is a, a plant breeder and now works with indigenous uh, communities out in Northern Wisconsin, I think. But anyways, we started doing uh, first just some basic trials and, and seeing, um, you know, what kind of yields we, we could get and what were some of the the issues and, and problems, and then distributing corn um, uh, to any longhouse in New York State that wanted white corn for ceremonial things. Um, we just gave it free. And then we started selling um, corn seed um, to, to indigenous growers, native Haudenosaunee growers who were interested. And very quickly, I would say within five to eight years, we were out of business, right? I mean, they. Um, the, the growers were, were doing it themselves, native growers um, all over New York and Canada. Um, you know, sometimes with, with trouble, um, you know, we, we would go and look and say, oh, well, you know, you, you really have to, you know, you're using a field that's been plowed for 10 years and you didn't provide any nutrients. Put some manure on it or put it in a rotation with alfalfa or, or clover for a year or two, but you've got to provide some fertility and then seconds weed control, 
right? Weed control is absolutely, you know, critical. So, but farmers all over, native farmers all over New York and on Ontario and Canada and Wisconsin are growing corn very effectively. Um, my, my work with indigenous food sovereignty has been more um, encouraging young native scholars um, who are interested um, in this, uh, just encouraging them um, because most of them are coming from native communities and they really know their communities. They, they know what people want, they know what people will, will do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I just stand on the sidelines and, and, you know, encourage and clap and say, you're doing a great job. And, and this is, I mean, one of the things that I do always mention is that farming is hard work. Um, and there's lots of times young people simply don't realize how incredibly, um, I mean, a lot of times it's drudgery, right? You have to go out on, on hot days and, and pick, you know, um, you know, potato beetles off of leaves. You, you have to go out and, and hoe quackgrass out, out of a, you know, corn, right? Um, it's not always fun and, and wonderful, right? It, it's hard work. Um, but the, the, the rewards of it and the, and the, the feeling that you're, you are um, really contributing to your, you know, community. The, the Anadog is up, you know, they're an hour away from me, um, north. Um, they have a whole group of, of, of young farmers um, that are just doing in, incredible work, right? They, they really have revitalized agriculture and are working very hard on, on improving food systems in their you know, community. Um, Indian communities have been devastated by Western food, right? Um, and it is really hard once people get used to eating um, salt, fat, sugar, um, it's really, really hard. And you have to start with young people and change their, their palates, right? And get them used to eating food that, that not only tastes great, but that's good for you. So most of my efforts is just to say, you're doing a great job, right? Um, ask me an agronomic question and I'll do my best to, to give you good advice, right? You know, you, you need to plant earlier and you need to do better weed control. You need to think about um, how you're going to control that, you know, disease. You need to, um, all sorts of things like that. But I'm finding now that I'm getting fewer and fewer of those questions because the experienced people are in the communities themselves. Well, we've reached about four o'clock and I think that's a wonderful uh, note to wrap in on or wrap up on rather. Uh, so on behalf of the Prairie Research Institute, the Illinois State Archaeological Survey and the Office of the State Archaeologist, a big thank you to Dr. Mount Pleasant uh, for a fantastic lecture today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us this afternoon and for the rest of the series if you made it. Uh, I do want to let you know that this lecture was recorded and it will be posted on the ISAS YouTube page with the entirety of the rest of the series. So thank you everyone uh, for coming and thank you to Dr. Mount Pleasant again and have a good evening. Thank you for inviting me, it's been a pleasure.